Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. Strange vibrations begin. A warm sensation ripples through your body, gently pulling you from yourself and out into an undiscovered plane of existence. You are now an astral traveler. The out-of-body experience is a globally shared phenomenon that reaches back to the very genesis of human existence. What celestial landscapes lie beyond? What sorts of entities have been contacted? And what guardians oversee the barriers between? On this episode of Belief Hole, we step through the looking glass and enter the realms of elsewhere. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. jury. In. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Feldman. magicians are demons, specters, and spirits, spirits summonings, paralysis, strange disappearances, sky whale phenomena, yes. alternative history, shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. And Naki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. That's old. Y two K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Welcome to Bleeful. I'm Chris. I'm Jeremy. And I am John. Yes, you are. We are the Brothers Three, here to present some extremely engaging information. <laughs> Good sell. Doesn't that sound compelling? <laughs> what interesting content we must have today, Chris. Oh, today's going to be another fantastic episode. What is it? What's the deal? We're going to be talking about astral landscapes and OBE adventures. That's out of body for those who are unfamiliar with that term. OBE. Yes, we're going to talk about what it's like to visit the astral plane. What type of landscapes you'll experience? What type of entities you might encounter there? Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down. What do you mean by astral plane? Are we talking like dreams? Are we talking like life after death? Kind of all that. We're going to get into that through the help of Robert Monroe, who we talked about before, and Kurt Leland, someone who mm. came after Robert Monroe, both adventurers into Robert the- Robert Monroe's still alive, isn't he? You know, I don't know. He's pretty, if he's alive, he's pretty old. He started his- <laughs> He's listening right now. His he's first, like, guys. His first out-of-body experience- He's pretty old. Happened in 1958. I don't think he's alive anymore. He could be. Dad was born in 41. That's true. The first thing that came up was Robert Monroe obituary, so. Yeah, yeah I was pretty sure he yeah, was gone. Could be. There's probably more than one Robert he Monroe. He died in uh, September 21. Oh, really? This year he- So that's the right guy, you sure? That, that was him that died? It's not some other Robert Monroe? Bob, Bob Monroe? He also went by Bob. Robert E. Monroe. As one would, named Robert. There's a lot of Bob and Rose on this page. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Could still be alive. He died 95. He did? Yeah. Okay. Well, rest in peace, Bob. At age 80. How is that possible? What do you mean? Well, didn't you say he was born in 55? No, no, no. His first experience out of body was uh, in 1958. Okay, 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 okay. He was born in 1915 in Indiana, October 30th, 1915. <gasps> on All Hallows Eve Eve. Okay. Now that we got the rundown on Bob, he's no longer with us, but he might be in maybe listening some form of the astral. Well, right? that's that's what I was just about to say. Yeah, I mean, if you think if you listen to his accounts, his experiments that he did through his constant traveling into the astral realm, unwillingly or initially unexpectedly by accident, he would tell you that you would visit the after death realm as one of the several different places you might encounter these different realms. So, according to Robert Monroe, it is possible to experience some version of a life after death plane as someone who is not yet dead. Yes. Okay. Interesting. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into how that works through his research and through Kurt Leland's own experiences. We're going to talk about him towards the end of the episode, but we're going to explore these lands. As Kurt Leland would say, we are going to try to map the non-physical realm of the astral plane. But before we get into that, what's coming up in the expansion, Jer? Oh, you know, I'm glad you asked. It's going to be a timely episode. This is a topic I've wanted to cover for a long time. So expansion members, buckle up. We are getting into suppressed advanced free energy technologies. And I know, I know some of you out there, skeptics that listen and those with more of a cynical sneer at the free energy topic. I understand where you're coming from, okay? 
It's a lot to say that we are beating the laws of thermodynamics in order to provide a kind of free energy, tapping the quantum realm, if you will, for free energy, zero point energy. But we're not just talking about that. We're also going to be talking about freedom of energy, which means energies that have been developed, that have been patented, that had their inventors either silenced or killed. Right. Who's the water car guy? What's Stanley it? Myers. It's yeah. a classic example. Whether you believe he was killed or not, he claimed that he was on while he was dying poisoned in a Cracker Barrel parking lot in Ohio. Not a good way to go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ohio guy, at least for some of his life. Obviously, that conversation is one that we're all passionate about here, and I'm sure it might sound compelling to you. So sign up for the expansion if you want to hear us do a deep dive into that. Yeah, we're going to get into Tesla, maybe Marconi, as well as some modern guys that I mentioned, including Bob Lazar. So yeah, stick around for that expansion, members. If you're not a member yet, go to bluefull.com and click the red expansion member button to sign up and join us there. Yes! Double the episodes. Cool! All right, Chris, punch us into the astral realm. All right, strap in and let loose your second body. Weird. Which is what Robert Monroe termed the astral form you take. If you look at theosophy, there's like seven different bodies. We're not going to do a history lesson on theosophists and theosophy, but that was what brought the concepts of astral traveling from Eastern Europe, from the Orient, the Orient, from all over the world into Western consciousness, starting to spread these ideas. Because the idea of astral travel has been around for thousands of years. You look at the Egyptian cultures, you know, the soul traveling, you look at Taoists, you look at Hindu religion. And then of course you have like shamans, whether it be Native American or other indigenous cultures around the world. This idea is not a new one, but it became new in the 19th century here when theosophists, like Blavatsky, like Blavatsky brought these ideas over from these other places and then tried to build on it and explore these regions of reality. And then introduced into the commercial mainstream through Stan Lee. Was it Stan oh, Lee? Yeah. Marvel Comics? Mm-hmm. Doctor Strange? Right. It's, yep. If anyone's seen those movies recently, he, you see him astral projecting or, you know, throwing his consciousness mm-hmm. or... Yeah, it's all over pop culture. Traveling on the astral plane. These days. What did you just do to me? I pushed your astral form out of your physical form. What's in that tea? Psilocybin, LSD. It's just tea with a little honey. But it is an old idea. Yeah, but the reality of it is that up to 20% of the world's population has claimed to have experienced OBEs, or at least in America alone. So consider places where these ideas are not as taboo or at least haven't been for a longer period of time. I would imagine it's even higher over there in places like India and Tibet. Yeah. So even though the 20% of people have reported experiencing out-of-body experiences at some point in their life, obviously there are people who are very skeptical of this. Right. Um, Do you want to read this quick quote here from Live Science? This is sort of a skeptical point on out-of-body experiences because I have a point to make after. Practitioners of astral travel insist that the experience must be real because it seems so vivid and because some of the experiences are similar, even for people from different cultures. But it's not surprising that many people who try astral projection have similar experiences. After all, that's what the term, quote, guided imagery is. When an authority, such as a psychologist or astral travel teacher, tells a person what they should expect from the experience. Yeah, my response to that is obviously you have all these experiences that people are having that are very similar. Like we talk about the vibrations, we talk about, you know, the rushing sounds in your head. We talk about what people experience after they leave their body. And the key point here is that a lot of times these aren't people who've never experienced it or heard about this sort of phenomenon. Like when I had mine, I didn't know anything about, I mean, I've heard of -of out-of-body experiences, but I didn't know you about didn't the vibration. Out, yeah. You didn't seek out a teacher right. in the astral projection. Yeah, I mean, I get their point here. Obviously, like if you're trying to learn how to do it, you could maybe imagine that you're having these experiences. But when you're someone who's just off the street... It just sounds like they don't really understand the intricacies of all the experiences. Right. right. Well, and that's that's the thing about having these experiences and people who've never had one. It seems like a very layman thought about the whole thing. Right. Someone doesn't look too deeply yeah, into it. Yeah, doesn't look very Well, it's very like anything, which is understandable. It's like anything. Right. It's like, well, it's, you could say the same thing about alien abduction. Well, you know, people say they see a great an alien because it's everywhere in pop culture or right, a gray alien. Right. You know what I mean? It couldn't be the other way around. It's, it's right. a cursory understanding of what the topic is. Yeah. What people are experiencing. And either way, it's it's neither proof nor not proof because right. you could argue that either way. But that was just my point here was that they were saying because some people are guided, then that's why everybody has common experiences, even though a lot of people are not guided. But this episode is not about proving out-of-body experiences. This episode is talking about what it's like when you get there. What it's like to experience an out-of-body experience. Part. If you do not believe, just suspend that disbelief just for just the enjoyment ex- of the episode. Just accept it. Yeah, but <laughs> just accept it. <laughs> just accept it. But speaking of proof, we, I do want to one day do a deep dive into Project Stargate, where there's some mm. really interesting, pretty unbelievable experiments that had positive results when the CIA led that program. And that was about remote viewing, which is related to out-of-body experiences, astral travel. And didn't you say that there were scientists that had looked over the data from that specific experiment, the Project Stargate? that the 
final conclusion essentially was that it was more reliable than could have been through just chance. Yeah. There was enough evidence through that investigation, through that experiment, that the official scientists, quote unquote, were basically saying, yeah, this right. there is something to this. Yeah, so there is an article, and we'll do this episode in detail one day, but there was an article from UC Davis that I came across, and there were two scientists who were reviewing the research of the CIA. They both agreed there were more positive responses for it to be something that's not anomalous. So they both agreed it's anomalous, and there's more rate of success than there should be if it wasn't a phenomenon. But one said, we need to do more research, basically a little more skeptical, like to say all these anomalous things prove out-of-body cognition. And the other scientist basically was saying like, this proves that there is, now we need to figure out how it works. Right. So, and for those of you who don't know, just real quick, remote viewing is essentially being able to see something in a different place where you are not currently located right. and, and using that evidence of like, oh, they were able to like pinpoint this missile installation in Russia, for instance. Yeah, a target basically. A target that was given by the people setting up the experiment was actually seen by the remote viewers. Yeah. And that whole process is super fascinating. We'll do that on its own dedicated episode. But let's start talking about what it's like to astral travel, what you might experience when you are crossing these boundaries. Let's do it. So real quickly, a refresher on Robert Monroe, who we're getting into first here, our first adventurer into the astral realm. He created Ram Enterprises, basically a corporation that produced radio network programs. In 1956, the firm created a research and development division to study the effects of various patterns of human consciousness. We talked about this when we did our binaural beats episode. I mean, that's kind of what got him into this, right? It, like accidentally. Yeah, he started having accidental, unintentional episodes of leaving his body because he was exploring the experiments that his the research development wing of his corporation was looking at, which is how sounds affected human right. consciousness, right? It almost has a sort of Marvel origin story if you think <laughs> yeah. of him as like a Like he creates superhero. a corporation. The department of that corporation is investigating the effects of audio patterns on human consciousness and sleep. And so he's, you know, self-experiments with right. it. And then that's where he gets the beginning awakening to these, quote, abilities. Yeah. Basically, they're trying to make self-help tapes and he's putting these on when he's sleeping. They're seeing if they can use this to train people how to do things. They still use that today, I think, some areas, some people sell those kinds of things. But this is what started kicking him out of his body. So when he leaves his body, he starts to experience what he calls his second body. So let us begin there with what that is like to discover. John, will you read this first one here? This is the second body. This is July 19th, 1958 in the afternoon. I was again on the couch, feeling very smooth vibrations. I opened my eyes and looked around, and everything seemed normal, and the vibrations were still there. I then moved my arms, which were folded, and stretched them upward as I lay on my back. They felt outstretched, and I was astounded when I looked, for there were my arms still folded over my chest. I looked upward to where I felt them, and I saw the shimmering outlines of my arms and hands in exactly the place they felt they were. I looked back at the folded arms, then at the bright shadow of them outstretched. I could see through them to the bookshelves and beyond. It was like a bright glowing outline which moved when I felt them move or made them move willfully. I wiggled my fingers, and the glowing fingers wiggled, and I felt them wiggle. I put my hands together and the glowing hands came together and I felt my hands clasp each other. They felt just like ordinary hands, no different. For nearly 10 minutes, I lay there attempting to compare this strange evidence to determine differences. I moved one outline hand to the shelf by the cot and I couldn't feel the shelf. My outline hand went right through it. The vibration started to fade and I quickly moved the glowing outline arms and hands back to my chest. It felt exactly as if I slipped on long sleeve oh, gloves. Yeah. I didn't want to get caught outside, even just my arms without the vibrations. I don't know what would happen, if anything, and maybe I don't want to find out. This is Weird. what's interesting. I love this about this book, by the way. He'll introduce a concept and really break this down scientifically on these experiments, but they're all journal entries of what he's doing in this astral plane, in these out-of-body experiences. You know, it's the other th fascinating thing is like when I had my out-of-body experience, like I didn't know what was going on. I kind of realized it as it was happening, but I didn't have time to worry about the vibrations slipping away. For him, it was like the vibrations would start to slow and his OBE would come to an end. So he was worried about not getting back into his body before the vibrations stopped because he didn't know if he'd outside. be stuck outside of his body. Yeah. Um, a lot of people report that they get snapbacks. So I don't think that's so much of a concern. 
But I just thought that was kind of interesting. And that the idea of like putting gloves on, like that's what it feels like when he puts his yeah. hands back in. It's also his. creepy because there is that idea of when you are astral traveling, your body is a receptacle for a consciousness. And if you leave it unattended too long. Right. Well, we'll get to there, that. There's that chance that something else could come in, basically wear you like a suit. Like a frogger? Yeah, like a frogger. Except in, in a house? In a body, not a house. Yeah. <laughs> the house is the that's body of creep, the soul. That's a creepy idea. We did an episode on that. Well, kind of. Is that what it's called? Frogging, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same idea with channeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something coming into your body. Yeah. That's how possession can probably happen too. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, that's kind of what it would be on the astral plane if you, you know. If it's a baddie. If it's a baddie, not a goodie. Right. Well, we'll get to that later because there's actually a reference to that that he brings up. When he starts to explore these other lands. Well, let's go. Let's do it. Let's get in there. Let's start to talk about what the astral plane looks like. Now that we've, we kind of get an idea of what his experience was like with his second body, as he calls it, which we all have, by the way, according to him. When I had my experience, I didn't see any, I don't remember noticing my body. I remember going through the door, trying to push it open, but I don't remember what my arm looked like. All right. So for this part, for this astral plane exploration, he talks about three locales, three places that he's visited that he calls locale one, two, and three. And this is, this is where it gets interesting because this is where you start to explore the different non-physical planes, as he calls them. The first one, the here now, is what he calls it. It's basically your world around you right now where physical laws apply and everything's the same. You're just visiting, you're just floating through it. Oh, okay. Like when I had mine, that was what I was visiting. So it'd be the, kind of remote viewing. If you're remote viewing something in, re, in our reality, far away, but as we experience reality, you're just kind of floating, vi- visiting right. it from but, your- but I, The difference also is remote viewing. You're not, you don't have the sensation of separating from your body. It's more of like oh, a, a oh, mental okay. projection, as far as I understand it. Okay. That's for another episode. But so locale one, the here now, is everywhere around you where you could potentially maybe interact with other people who are here. This is where he does most of his investigation because it's the only place you can really prove to yourself what's going on, that this is, this is real. This is where the experience would happen. Right. Like what word was written on the chalkboard in the other room. Right. That kind of thing. But you could also go through remote viewing. Right. But, but this we're not talking about remote Sorry, viewing. Sorry, my bad. I didn't mean <laughs> to confuse it, okay? That's okay. So that's locale one. Locale two... Jim, read this bit here from Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. Locale 2 is a non-material environment with laws of motion and matter, only remotely related to the physical world. It is an immensity whose bounds are unknown to this experimenter and has depth and dimension incomprehensible to the finite, conscious mind. In this vastness lie all of the aspects we attribute to heaven and hell, which are but part of Locale 2. It is inhabited, if that is the word, by entities with various degrees of intelligence with whom communication is possible. Time, by the standards of the physical world, is non-existent. There is a sequence of events, a past and a future, but no cyclical separation. Both continue to exist coterminously with now. Does it make sense? Sure. (laughs) It's basically... Sort of like what you experience in the dream state, in a lucid dream state. It's a place where your thoughts attract scenarios, attract things to occur. You almost have an inability to separate yourself from the environment because you create, sort of create the environment yourself. This is, this is the zone of locale two for him. It's a zone that is also linked to the after death state. As he mentions, it's what seemed to him to be a place where what religions speak about with heaven and hell, where that sort of place exists. And without getting into the whole theology side of this whole conversation, it would be like potentially people that are there being tormented or tormenting themselves because whatever they have attracted in this life or whatever, they're attracting again to themselves in the next sort of like, like for like, as he calls it. It's I mean, if you've seen the movie, What Dreams May Come, Mm -hmm. it it reminds me of that idea a lot. The idea that you are at a place where you can essentially create reality around you. Mm -hmm. That time doesn't really work in a linear kind of way. Everything is kind of just Kind of like VR. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, when he was describing the arms going out of the body, mm-hmm. like seeing his own hands and the wiggling fingers, yeah. I kept thinking we play of, that putt putt game, and you can just like go over there, you know, yeah. and like you float in the air. That's just kind of you know, what's really funny feel. about that. Yeah. I just thought about this. He does talk about later on. He tries. We'll get to this. There's a locale three he gets to, which is a pretty strange place. But he said even there, the rules apply. And one of the first rule is to arm stretched out straight up. Oh, to really? begin to fly, <laughs> just like which is just the, like that ping yeah. or that golf game we play. But yeah, so this, you guys should check it out. Definitely check it out. Join us in there. Maybe uh, we'll put that as a tier. Come play pup pup with us. Quite fun. In the simulation. So to kind of summarize the idea of this locale two, before we get to locale three, this place is a place where thought is king. There's no need for obviously industry, transportation, technology, communication, because it's all, you know, thought is instant. You, what you want is what you get. But he says it's like your innermost desire or your innermost, I guess that's where the karma would come from. It's not even sometimes something that you're aware of, but right. you draw things that's to you. Why, yeah, if you have a dark heart, 
Mm-hmm. Right. Or exactly. even if you have trauma, you know, or if you have an experience where after death, for instance, you haven't figured it out yet, right? right. Where you're still reeling from whatever it is. It could be something you have to deal with for a while. Right. The idea is that you may not consciously want to go somewhere or do something over there, but you will go there and you will do that because you're over soul or whatever. Yeah. There's, there's so much to get into. I don't want to get stuck on one thing, but the super interesting part here is that there is solid matter there as well as artifacts that are common to our reality. Hmm? Artifacts. Artifacts, like things here, like a lamp, a train, uh, this and that. He says, according to him, that these are brought into existence by one of three ways. One, someone who lived in the physical world, they automatically, without deliberate intent, will draw these things into existence there. Just because of patterns of their own life, you know. Maybe a big party or you're going to bring in the booze. I don't know. (laughs) The second way is by people who are well-practiced in this second locale place that want to create a space that reminds them of their place here in this physical reality. So they'll build what they want. They'll bring things into that reality based on their intention because they are now aware. They've moved past the intense emotional aspect of being there after death or whatever, and they understand where they are and they start to create a world around them. And lastly, by what Monroe assumes to be a higher order of intelligent beings more aware of Locale 2 environment than most inhabitants. Their purpose seems to be that of a simulation of the physical environment to temporarily, at least for the benefit of those just emerging from the physical world, relieve their concerns after death. So Hmm. it's like, you know, it's interesting, and we'll get into this a little bit when we get to talk a little more about Locale 2, but the uh, idea of, we've talked about that in near-death experiences before, where there almost seems to be like technicians. When right. something goes wrong during a life review or something. Yeah, I was going to say, this sounds like where a life review would occur. Right. Right. Depending on your whatever belief system you have going into it, this might be the kind of environment for that to take place. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because it reminds me when we covered uh, Bocce and his spirit radio. Yeah. And the descriptions of that other world were the, uh, I forget what they called them, the communicators, the speakers from the other the side. Scientists. Yeah, on the other side, yeah. what they describe their world as. And it's, it sounds like it kind of lines up with this idea of this locale too. That's what's fascinating about this. Yeah, it's an after death zone, right? But it's also this place where there is technology. It's also important to note that also when we did the Bocce episode is that because it is the after death zone or it is this place of where, you know, life review all these things, uh, it's not necessarily the final destination. I remember that right. in the Bocce one too, is they were aware of a greater place that they could go yeah. or this kind of pinpoint a doorway. But this was kind of the bridge between that next step and our living existence right. was this locale too, not called locale too, but yeah. similar, similar plane. Interesting. Interesting stuff. And this takes us to the idea of these, what he calls activity clusters, which is basically where there are people that are aware and they're living in this locale too. And as I said, once you get past the raw motion, you can start to have an effect on your location and the inhabitants there are still human. Like it might be a somewhat non-physical place, but there's a human environment there. John, will you read one of his experiences here in the after death plane? On one visit, I ended up in a park-like surrounding. Weird, because I just had a dream last night about this. Was it a dream or was it an astral realm? I don't know, but it was awesome. I forgot I had it until just now. Well, read this and see if it sounds familiar. On one visit, I ended up in a park-like surrounding with carefully tended flowers, trees, and grass, much like a large mall with paths crisscrossing the area. There were benches along the paths, and there were hundreds of men and women strolling by or sitting on the benches. Some were quite calm, others a little apprehensive, and many had a dazed or shocked look of disorientation. They appeared uncertain, unknowing of what to do or what was to take place next. Somehow I knew that this was a meeting place, where newly arrived waited for friends or relatives. From this place of meeting, these friends would take each newcomer to the proper place where he or she belonged. I could not think of any reason to stay longer, there was no one nearby recognized, so I returned to the physical without incident. Weird. Does that sound at all like... Wait, wait. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was awesome, though. It was like a house. And I just remember being like really excited, like this was a new house. It was just like beautiful piece of property. It wrapped around the back, and there was like a hot tub up there. <laughs> it was awesome. excited. It was, it was wonderful. It sounds- I just remember thinking like, this is going to be such a great place to live. Oh, and, woke and then up. I woke up. That's such a great... <laughs> and I was like, I'm in cold Ohio. It's a great feeling. Well, it is interesting that you just mentioned that in the first place because this place is also a place where dreamers go, which we'll find out later according to Leland's research, the next adventure we're going to talk about, where there is sort of a connection between the after-death zone and lucid dreaming state. Right. Yeah. What, didn't he call them sleepers or something? Yeah. And we'll get to that. Okay. That's going to be interesting. But that would explain when a loved one who's passed visits you in a dream. Right. Or can yeah, find we'll talk you about that later. Okay. So we're holding on to that. Hold on to that. I'll keep button it up. 
Weird. Yeah. Let me just say something real quick. I was over at one of my friend's house yesterday and there was one guy over there. He was telling him that I did a podcast, you know, about this stuff. And he had a couple stories, but we got into dreams and people that had died. And he said there was a couple of stories where it was like either he or someone else had these profound dreams right after someone had died. And in the dream, I think he was talking about someone else at this point. Someone else had this dream of his friend that had died. And uh, he was just telling him like, man, you died. You shouldn't be here. And he's like, I died? Oh, weird. And, and then like, he was like, yeah, man, you're dead. And then he just woke up and it was just like this profound feeling like he had just realized. Yeah. And then there's some kind of other tie-in where it was like he was having these experiences and then he never dreamed about him after that. Weird. weird. Yeah. Like he almost like he was helping him. Like he didn't know. Understand. Like you're in these one of these worlds and you know, like when you're sleeping, you don't always know that you're, you don't know that you're asleep. You're just there. Exactly. Right. So you're saying the guy who was dead didn't know he was dead? Yeah. Okay. In the yeah. dream. Yeah. That's it fascinating. Just, it makes me wonder, especially with what we're going to talk about later in this episode, it makes me wonder if was he potentially astral traveling in his dream state and then running into his friend who would be in this potentially waiting area and maybe unaware as a lot of these souls are that they have died. Yeah, Aging does, Mr. Herman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does sound like you can cross over in a sense to an, the astral plane while dreaming, right? Isn't that possibility yeah. according to Monroe. Yeah. We'll get there. Okay. So, but after this experience, obviously like this is super fascinating for him, this experience, a little unnerving seeing these people who seem to be maybe recently died, but he goes back and this time more deliberately, he sets out to explore in the hope of finding someone who can answer a question, maybe someone who's aware and someone who knows what's going on there and concentrating hard enough. He says that he thought, quote, I wish to go where there are higher intelligences. And he flew faster and faster through this space until he did. And John, will you read this, this entry from him? Finally, I stopped. I was in a narrow valley which seemed normal in all respects. There were men and women in ankle-length robes, dark in color. This time I decided for some reason to take another tack. I approached several women and asked them if they knew who I was. All were quite polite and treated me with great respect, but gave negative answers. I turned away and asked the same question of a man in a monk's robe, who seemed hauntingly familiar. Yes, I know you, the man replied. There was a strong sense of understanding and friendship in his attitude. I asked him if I truly knew who I was myself. He looked at me as if he had met an old and dear friend who now had amnesia. You will. He smiled gently as he said it. I asked him if he knew who I had been last. I was trying to get him to say my name. You were last a monk in Coshocton, Pennsylvania. He replied, I started to get uneasy and apologetically left, returning to the physical. So right there is, you know, he's telling him that you were... I wonder why he got uneasy. Well, I think because he wasn't expecting him to tell him that he was used to be someone else. Yeah. He just wanted him to say like, he meant who was I before, like before I came here, as in like, today. who am I today in my body? Right. You know, but they're like, oh yeah, you were a monk that I knew. And Kashakti's like, what? So I think he was a little un unnerved. Yeah. Which is interesting is when he goes back, he has a friend who was a Catholic priest and... So this is pre-internet, but his friend who was a Catholic priest did some research and found out there was a monastery near Kashokta. Really? So he was I was just wondering that. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I just thought that was interesting. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do one more experience in this locale too when things get really strange. And then we'll move into some explorations by Kurt Leland where he meets some gatekeepers, some rangers, and some sleepers in the other realm. Very cool. Interesting. All right, guys. Enjoy this preview into the expansion episode on... Suppressed energy technologies and free energy technologies that are suppressed. <laughs> Enjoy. Access granted. So this little bit here, I'm just going to read about zero point energy, tapping the vacuum, if you will. This is a bit that comes from the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Southampton in the UK. Now he quotes a guy by the name of Dr. Harold E. Putoff, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, Texas. And he says... One of the most bizarre predictions of modern quantum theory is that each cubic centimeter of space, including that of the most pristine vacuum of outer space, contains an enormous amount of untapped electromagnetic energy, known as zero-point energy. It is the zero point from which all other energies are measured. The amount of the energy associated with this, usually unobserved, background is conservatively estimated to be the order of nuclear energy densities or greater. 
Dr. Putoff goes on to explain how theorists have tended to question the enormity of the energy density involved, but how, over the years, the discovery of the Casimir force and other effects have given quantitative verification. And that's what Hutchison thinks is happening, is the Casimir effect. This force results from unbalanced pressures in zero-point field due to the presence of metallic plates that are placed very closely together. There's something going on at the quantum level that they're not exactly sure, but it's creating some sort of pressure, and that's where we get that zero-point energy from. Essentially, it's tapping a jittering effect. The idea is that at the quantum level, you know, we've heard about the idea that things are constantly moving at the quantum level. There's the vibration. The vibration. The vibration. If you like that clip and you want to hear more, head over to beliefhold.com and hit the expansion button. Every time we release an episode, we drop another full episode that's just as awesome as what you're hearing now. Check it out. We're back. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back to Locale 1. Let's go back to Locale 2. Let's do it. Let's finish our adventure, our exploration into Monroe's Locale 2, where things start to get pretty strange, if they haven't already. So in his explorations for Locale 2, he says uh, that there have been places that he's visited where he's come across groups that appear to be in uniform, which operate highly technical equipment and identified themselves as, quote, the target army. Whatever that means. Target army. At least that's what he said his mind interpreted what they had said to him. Ensuring low prices. What they had, quote, said. All this is like, quote, see, quote, here, you know. (laughs) What was that, Jer? Nothing. Bad joke. (laughs) He said ensuring low prices. (laughs) Such a good story. But their purpose was never disclosed to him. But it was just an interesting, you know, so this keeps getting odder. keeps getting more more than just your typical, what we would think of like an after-death realm. He said another visit took him to a well-organized city where his presence was immediately construed as hostile. And only by taking evasive action, like running and hiding and then finally lifting straight up was he able to avoid, quote, capture. He said the appearance of very aggressive actions tended to confirm again that Locale 2 is not solely a place of serenity and non-conflict. Oh, yikes. Yeah, so interesting. And this is where we have the last encounter we're going to do today from this Locale 2 that's uh, a little unsettling. He goes on to say, On another trip, I was accosted by a conventionally dressed man. Do you remember Orozio Lafranco? I said no. I'm sure you will remember if you think back. There was a demanding in his attitude which made me uneasy. So I said, I don't remember anyone by that name. Do you know anyone at all down there? He asked me. Okay, at this point, Monroe goes limp, and then someone else grabs his other arm. They start dragging him toward three bright lights. He says, quote, I struggled and finally broke loose when I remembered to use the, quote, go to physical signal. I moved away rapidly and after a short time was back in the office and into the physical. Evidently, hopefully, I had been mistaken for someone else. Weird. Yeah. Maybe so, so he did something in a past life to uh, Orosio Lafranco. Maybe. Or maybe they just thought he was somebody else. You hear about clerical errors in the near-death experiences, things weird. like that. Like we talked about where people were thought they just had the name wrong, mm-hmm. where someone died in a hospital and then he came back, was revived, and someone else died after he had had a near-death experience where someone had said, well, we got the wrong Jim Smith. So the moral of the story is go into the light, but avoid the three lights. Yeah, apparently. I wonder, so what's the go to physical signal? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So throughout the book, and we're not getting into this, but if you guys are interested, he talks about different signals that he's, he trained himself to use to remind himself where he was and to Get basically back. wake his regular body back up where he could signal to himself to be retrieved back into his own body. Okay. Uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of technical stuff, which is another thing I like about his experiments here. They are experiments, at least hmm. in, in, he's the one experiencing them but he's recounting them all. Sounds like that was part of the astral mob or something. Yeah. Well, dude, was yeah, that was yeah. Lafranco was part of the mob. And yeah, that's like the Italians running up there too. Yeah, apparently so. <laughs> it's nice to have a get out of jail card like that. Right. Like, go, to, go to physical. Yeah. As long as you remember. Where can someone get this book though, Chris? Is that going to be? Oh, we'll have it on the website. Oh, in sure. the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. Classic. Yeah. Very interesting. It's not all just like fun and games, right? Who knows what would have right. happened. Well, yeah, when you're going into other realms that aren't meant for the living. And there are boundaries. There are gatekeepers. Well, meant for the earthly living. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because they're living. Exactly. They're just living over there after this death. The non-physical, maybe. But yeah. as we'll see later on with Kurt Leland's work, titled Otherware, and his experiences in this Otherware, 
there are boundaries and there are gatekeepers. It's a kind of interesting twist on it too. The idea that you would keep astral travelers from fully being able to witness the life after death place, right? right. Isn't that kind of the idea? Mm-hmm. And that might appear as like a desert or a wall, someplace you can't cross that, how it manifests in different ways or there are gatekeepers keeping because there are different well maybe are you gonna get into that yeah. the different kinds of people that yeah, are yeah. There? okay we'll get into that <laughs> i'm just excited hold your horses bud let's finish up with monroe here so to wrap up locale two i just thought this was a super fascinating thing that i came across that will remind you of our bocce episode something that relates to near-death experiences and near-death communication in regards to this locale two he says that one of the things that must be mentioned when discussing locale two is quote the motion of travel which is usually rapid and smooth in OBE experiences, has been interrupted by what feels like a violent hurricane-like gust in the spatiality through which one moves. It is as if you are being blown away by this uncontrolled force, tossed haphazardly around over and over like a leaf in a gale. It is impossible to move against this torrent or do anything but let it carry you. Finally, you are tossed near the edge of the current and you drop out, unharmed, back in the physical. There is nothing to identify it, but it feels natural rather than artificially created. Hmm. This reminds me of, do you remember when Bocce and others were trying to communicate and they were getting recordings of the dead, but there would be the sound of wind. Oh, yeah. Uh, like uh, as if they were standing on a precipice. Mm-hmm. Just a weird connection there. Like an astral tornado. Yeah. Winds to... of the dead. Exactly. Winds of the dead barricading the living from communicating. So it would suck if you were our version of living, visiting a world you may not be supposed to be in. Mm-hmm. And it sucks you up and it spits you out. That's what it sounds like. Back in the world. I just thought that was an interesting tie in. Sucks you up, Buttercup. Sucks them up. Yes. What is that from? Sucks them up. Sucks them up. That's dad. Oh, dad. Okay. <laughs> remember those. All the balls are around you. Suck them up. Suck them up. What? The dream when he. Remember when dad he would be sleeping and we would ask him questions because it was totally ridiculous answers. Oh, yeah. And I asked him how a tornado worked. <laughs> and he said, all oh, the little balls are all around and I suck them up. <laughs> Because he had been watching the lottery right before he went to sleep. <laughs> right, where they have the balls that get sucked up. Oh, the 90s. Oh, that's no, that's great. No, oh, dad. Beautiful man. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, so funny. <laughs> All right, let's move away from Locale 2. Are you guys ready to finally check out Locale 3? Absolutely. Aren't you excited for this? I am. This is where things get weirder. Okay, we've gone to Locale 1, the everyday. Locale 2, sort of a dream meets the after death realm. Locale 3, he's not sure what this is at first. Let's see what it was like to experience, begin to experience this Locale 3. And he says the best way to get acquainted with Locale 3 is to take the significant experiments that he's done leading up to it directly from the notes. So that's what he does in this chapter. And we're going to kind of quickly go through some of these as it gets to the sort of climax of the Locale 3 experience. Oh, I I remember this. Jer, why don't you start though by reading his first account and then I'll kind of quickly take us through the progression of these experiments going into Locale 3. Tell us how it first starts on November 5th. 1958. So at this point, vibrations are coming. He's having trouble leaving his body, but he remembers the turning over trick. The 180 degree trick. The moment I reached this 180 degree position, there was a hole. That's the only way to describe it. To my senses, it seemed to be a hole in a wall, which was about two feet thick and stretched endlessly in all directions in the vertical plane. The periphery of the hole was just precisely the shape of my physical body. I touched the wall, and it felt smooth and hard. The edges of the hole were relatively rough, all this touching done with the non-physical hands. Sounds like you're describing the belief hole. That's what it is. That's where he's going. Didn't want to spoil it. (laughs) Just kidding. Beyond, through the hole, was nothing but blackness. It was not the blackness of a dark room, but a feeling of infinite distance and space as if I were looking through a window into distant space. I felt that if my vision were good enough, I could probably see nearby stars and planets. My impression, therefore, was of deep outer space beyond the solar system, far in an incredible distance. I moved cautiously through the hole, holding onto its sides, and poked my head through carefully. Nothing. Nothing but blackness. No people. Nothing material. I ducked back and hurriedly, because of the utter strangeness, I rotated back 180 degrees, felt myself merge with the physical, and sat up. It was broad daylight, just as when I had left what seemed a few minutes before. Lapsed time. One hour, five minutes. Yeah, so it seemed like a few minutes was an hour and five minutes. So he's in that space for a very brief amount of time, but in real life, time had passed an hour. By the way, that turning trick, it's basically, I'm not going into like the tips on how to astral travel, but when you are in a state of sleep paralysis and you feel vibrations, one of his tricks was to try to turn physically. And when his body was paralyzed, he would turn physically 
But that sense of rotation, like some people picture like a, going over a roller coaster, that sense of motion as he was turning would get his astral body, his second body to turn and leave. That's when he started seeing this hole. That's when he started seeing this entry into this, what becomes the third locale. It almost sounds like you're tugging on your silver cord by, yeah. by twisting. <laughs> right. You know, waking it up pulling yourself out. Interesting. And so I'm going to quickly take us through his sequence of nights and mornings. This happens in the morning, afternoon, nights, different times, but his experiments with this hole that he's experiencing, this human-shaped hole into this void. So November 18th, 1958 at night, the vibrations are strong, the hole's there. This time he's more cautious. He reaches a hand through into the blackness and his hand feels another hand. That hand shakes his hand. So he's shaking hands with someone in this darkness, in this abyss. Weird. He said it felt like a human hand. It was normally warm, like a human's, warm to the touch. December 5th, 1958. So almost a month later, in the morning, he rotates again. Again, there's that hole. He cautiously reaches with both hands. He grabs two other hands. Suddenly he hears a feminine voice that's soft, calling his name, almost as if it's someone who would say your name to wake you up. Very insistent. Then he asks, what is your name to this person he's holding hands with in this abyss? What is your name? And he said this, that there was this commotion and activity, quote, as if my words had created the effect of dropping a stone into a still lake or pond like rippling, scurrying, crackling, etc. There was this excitement on the other side when he oh, was weird. trying to communicate. They were reacting to it. December 27th. So again, like weeks go by, it's at nighttime, 1958. And again, the vibrations, again, the hole appears. Again, he rotates, he peeks through the hole. Now he hears a voice calling to someone else as if to say, hey, come here, he's coming. He's coming out, saying Bob's coming. So there's another person there trying to get someone else's attention. He's a spectacle on the other side. Yeah, so th these things keep happening. He's Another time he's sensing a friendliness in the hole. Then something very unsettling happens. He reaches his hand down and he feels what feels like a hook dig into his hand. Go oh, freaky. Yeah. And he says it dug in more deeply when he tried to withdraw his hand. Snagged him. He finally did and was somewhat shaken. He said, quote, I felt as if the hook had gone right through my hand. It was not necessarily painful, but the effect was disturbing. I rotated to the physical and looked at my right hand physically. There were no marks or feeling, although the sensation of the penetration after effect was present. Isn't that weird? Bizarre. Yeah. He continues these experiments though. On the 5th of February in the afternoon, he says he puts his hand in and it's like he put it into electrified hot water. He said it was very painful and unpleasant. So that time it actually hurt him. Right. And then, so this is the next experiment with the hole. This happens in the afternoon, February 15th, 1959. I experimented with going in and out vertically, then rotated to the hole. Gathering courage, I pulled myself through in a sweeping rush. Just as a swimmer might pull himself through a hole underwater, I felt the other side of the hole, and the wall was similar to my side. I tried to see, but there was still nothing but the deep blackness. I decided to settle the matter once and for all. I shoved away from the hole and performed the stretch out in a direction exactly on a line away from the hole. I started to move slowly, and soon accelerated rapidly. I kept moving more rapidly, yet with only a slight sense of friction over my body, moving at what seemed a very high speed. I went on, waiting and expecting to get somewhere. After what seemed a very long time, I began to be concerned. I still saw nothing, felt nothing. Finally, I began to get nervous. Fears about becoming lost began to creep in. I slowed, stopped, turned around, and stretched out back in the direction of the hole. I took just as long to get back as it did to go. I was quite worried when I finally saw the light through the hole up ahead. I dove for it, went through, rotated, and sat up physically. Weird. Yeah, so basically he just wants to see how far he can go, and then he gets terrified because he's like, this is not getting anywhere. It's like deep sea diving. Yeah. Um, just so, like deep sea diving, uh, from my experience. <laughs> from your <laughs> deep <laughs> reservoir of personal experience. Jeremy, the unfortunate marine well, biologist. adventurer. Okay, so next we finally get some answers on what exactly is happening, what the strange experiences are. I want to know. Don't you want to know? <laughs> uh, so did he. So he adventured in again. And this happened February 27th, 1959. It's nighttime, and things start to become clear. Determined to find some more or even one answers about the hole, I went through the vibration in a 180-degree rotation pattern and deliberately went through. It was still black and dark, but not unpleasant. No hands, no presence, 
I could feel something solid under me, so I tried very hard to open my eyes and see. I did, and everything came into view. I was standing near a building, more like a barn than a house, on what was a wide, meadow-like area. I thought I would try to soar up into the sky. Deep, clear blue, no clouds. But I couldn't seem to get off the ground. Maybe I had weight here. There was what looked like a ladder a hundred feet or so away, and I went to it and realized it was a tower of some kind, about ten feet tall. Like a bird needing takeoff room, I climbed the tower to the top, leaped away in takeoff, and fell promptly to the ground with a solid thud. I got to my feet and realized how foolishly I was acting. I was not following the proper procedures. Even here, they had to be followed. I held my hands up and arms in the stretch out position and went up easily. I moved slowly over the meadow, enjoying the view and exploration, when suddenly something flew past me. I turned, just in time to see it, heading for the wall and the hole. I was afraid for some reason that this was something that would go through and try to enter my body. Creepy. So I wheeled in flight and dove for the hole. Too late. I realized that what I thought was the hole was a window in the side of the building, and then I was through the window and in the blackness. I felt around in the dark, and there was the outline of the hole. I went through, rotated, and sat up in the physical. Everything looked normal, and I was in the right place. The time passage was not too drastic, so back I went. <laughs> Vibrations were still strong, so I rotated 180 degrees, went through the hole and out into the brightness. More observant this trip, I noticed two people, a man and a woman, sitting in chairs near the outside of the building. I couldn't make contact with the man, but the woman seemed to know I was there. I asked her if she knew who I was, but I could get nothing other than a sense of awareness on her part. The vibrations started to fade, so I backed away, dove into the hole, rotated and sat up. Total time of the entire episode was 40 minutes. Weird. Very strange, Strange, right? So, the hole... Is this a hole? So once he leaves his body, that's when he enters a hole? Yeah. So the hole is... Hole's like in his room. But it's in the astral. So he's actually entering... It's like the gateway. Right. But you have to go... Th- is it like he steps into the astral and then through the yeah, hole? Yeah, it sounds like... So that there's that black hole, that abyss, right? It sounds like within that, there's the entry to this place that he's finally found, where this light is, where this other world is. So this whole time when he's been feeling other presences and the hook and all this stuff, it's is a populated place. Yeah, this other yeah place. it's very, very, very bizarre. Isn't that strange? So this is his takeaway. This is his conclusion here about Locale 3. Locale 3, in summary, proved to be a physical matter world, almost identical to our own. Except you can fly. Except you can fly. Well, if you're astral traveling, the people there can't, oh, okay. presumably. As long as you lift your arms up straight. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't work. It'd be funny if it was like Mario and you had to run really fast back and forth and then take off. Or a cap with a tail on it. <laughs> well, didn't some of that sound like dreams that you've had? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Where you start to go slowly and then you go faster, that kind of thing. Or you jump to get to take off from a high position. I don't stick my hand. When I fly, it's very rare. But when I do, it's more like a willing. You're yeah. like, oh, I know. It's I from the chest. This. Yeah. Solar well, and that's the like, thing. Uh, yeah. Like in your tum tum. <laughs> exactly. In your tum tum. That's the sound you make. Well, and that's the thing about astral traveling, right? What they talk about a lot is we do it when we're sleeping. Yeah. But that's what we think of as lucid oh, yeah. dreams. It's astral traveling into these other places. I can't tell you how many dreams, in quotes, I have where it's, there's just all, there's so, a lot of the time they're very bizarre, mm-hmm. but they're always with vivid people and places yeah. and experiences. Sometimes and people you've never met, sometimes yeah, places you've never been. And you're in this experience, and then all of a sudden I'll wake up and I'm yeah. like, what the f? That. You're like, what was real? What's yeah. real? This is this real or is that real? Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. They're you both know? real, John. You're just... And you're having these like sometimes deep experiences with these other beings, people, other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that would explain the phenomenon when we experience going to a place that we've been to before, but only in dreams. Right. right. And you, you wonder meet people you've met before, but yeah, only like, in the dream. How many times are you with these other people that you know over there and you don't remember? Yeah. When you, because when you're there, you're not questioning it. Yeah. You're just re-remembering. What if this, yeah, what we've talked about, like, this is the, this is the real dream. Mm-hmm. Trippy. You know? Hey, this is Locale 3. All right, let's, <laughs> hear, let's hear his conclusion on this. So everything's the same, right? The trees, the people, artifacts. By all appearances, they have a reasonably civilized society like ours. There are homes, families, businesses, and people work for a living. There are roads on which vehicles travel. There are railroads and trains. Now for the, quote, almost. This is where things are almost like ours, but aren't quite. Almost like our reality, our physical plane here, but not quite. At first, the thought was that Locale 3 was no more than some part of our world unknown to me and those others concerned. 
right? That would make sense. You'd think maybe this is just a place I've never been. This is Italy, somewhere in Italy I've never been to, right? It had all the appearances of being so. However, more careful study showed that it can be neither the present nor the past of our physical matter world here. The scientific development is inconsistent. There are no electronic devices whatsoever. Electricity, electromagnetics, and anything so related are non-existent. No electric lights, telephones, radios, television, or electric power. No internal combustion, gasoline, or oil were found as power sources. Yet mechanical power is used. Like Flintstones. Well, this is where he starts to talk about there's another power source here that he can't identify. He said the closest thing is basically like nuclear power, maybe. He says, spend enough time there. He went back so many times he was able to examine. They had train-like transportation, but it was being fueled by these containers with these strange pipes that came out of them <laughs> where they would go into these buildings and people would reload them very kind of cautiously with whatever fuel source they were using. It said the cars there were bigger than our cars and they were made of more like a wood material, but you would pa- you would steer them with your feet and move them with your hands like rowing. <laughs> like Flint's does. The lanes there were wider. The cars were overall bigger. Most vehicles had like bench seats with five or six people in more the vehicles. More communal world. A more communal Less world. smoggy. And you know, it's funny because we're going to be doing an episode on alternative power sources, but it's interesting. You think about, and I've heard this talked about before, we think of electrical power and gasoline power, nuclear power, nuclear fission, fusion as the only power sources that are possible. But those are just what in this reality right. we've happened to develop with our materials. There's probably other sorts of power that we just... It didn't occur to whoever came up with these ideas in the first place. What if there's a whole different, even like fire, like basic elements right. that because we went down that path from the beginning, this is where we ended up. <laughs> like way back when we started using fire for combustion. Yeah, like for everything heat. is built on it, yeah. you know, the learning process and there's just infinite amount of ways that that could go. Well, it makes me think of potentially forgotten and destroyed lost civilizations that were maybe superior and advanced. Maybe they were using like some sonic. sort of spiritual or some sort of energy source that we have yet to detect mm-hmm. with our instruments. But maybe on our own earth, we have in the past and has since been destroyed. Like flacco density? Exactly. I wasn't going to say. I'm glad you oh, said a flacco, flacco density. density. I was going to save that for the expansion. <laughs> flacco density. What a, rab- what a rabbit hole that is. <laughs> Google it, guys. Flacco density. <laughs> flacco density energy. Before this episode comes out, I'm going to buy flacco density.com. I'm going to see if flacco density is real. <laughs> So basically, it sounds like Locale 3 could be one of a number of any parallel or alternative realities. Right. Where so this is like we've gone through one and two. This three is, seems to be just another real reality, another world. Oh, this is the kicker. I forgot to mention this. At the end of this, he had a major discovery, John, there in, in Locale 3. And if you would, would you read this, this last entry from Monroe? Yeah. He's still Googling Flacco Density. Flacco Density <laughs> is not a real thing. Let's make it. <laughs> Unless it's on Locale 80. There you go. It could <laughs> be. Go. The major discovery came soon after I gathered the courage for extended expeditions into Locale 3. In spite of early indications, the people there were not aware of my presence until I met and, quote, merged temporarily and involuntarily with one who can only be described as the, quote, I who lives, quote, there. The only explanation I can think of is that I, fully conscious of living and being, quote, here, was attracted to and began momentarily to inhabit the body of a person, quote, there, much like myself. Weird. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Quantum Leap-esque. This began to be an automatic process when I went to Locale 3. I simply took over, quote, his body. There was no awareness of his mental presence when I temporarily displaced him. Pia! <laughs> My knowledge of him and his activities and his past came from his family and what was evidently his brain memory bank. Boy, if any of this is real, then the world that we do day to day (laughs) is ridiculous. Though I knew that I was not he, I could feel objectively the emotional patterns of his past. I have wondered what embarrassment I have caused him as a result of the periods of amnesia created by my intrusions. Some must have brought him much distress. Oh, poor yeah. guy. Reminds me of Quantum Leap. You know that television oh, yeah. show where Sam Beckett would leap in and then the guy would be in a waiting room somewhere while Sam took over his life? They'd explain to him, this is just temporary. What's on Netflix? But you know what's funny about this, John? <laughs> do you guys you remember My Big Toe? Yeah. I remember hearing that guy on Coast to Coast years ago and he was talking- I thought that was Robert Monroe. No. No. What's his name? Jim something? Sorry, we we looked into covering him on the last Jim. Last one to ask for projection. Earthworm. Earthworm Jim. <laughs> the same guy. Oh, Thomas Campbell. That's right. That's right. Tom Campbell. Yeah, not it, Jim. Flacco density. He's the one who covered <laughs> some of the experiments. I remember. Yeah, my big toe. I'm going to say, oh, I think it was him that I was listening to. Was someone talking about out of body experiences, but they were saying basically like you can travel to other use, and if you like that life more, stay there. Yeah. Which I always thought was a Terrible. Are you sure it was him? Terrible. I feel like maybe that, it wasn't his. Severe nostalgia. 
No, no, I just mean that's kind of unfair to do this to another you. Like, just because you can take their life because it's better. Like, maybe they worked harder. Yeah, they'll just go back. Hey, what happens to them? Go back to where? They just get to your life. Your life. You're like, God damn, this place is awful. You're like, this is not the trade that I envisioned. There, yeah, was, there was a guy that was selling to Flacco density. There's a guy that was selling <laughs> the ability to do that, right? To life leap or something in a different yeah, version. Maybe it was. It must not have been Tom's multiple realities. Yeah. And then you could just, you know, how do you prove that though? That's yeah. real, that's real tough. Well, we got one last adventure I want to get to here before we set sail. Okay, and I will say, I was kind of hoping to fit in this episode, but maybe the next listener story. We got a great story from Trevor, actually. Yeah, that- Which is it, a weird, awesome out-of-body, past-life yeah, type experience. Right, and the, you know, it's interesting, and we, I talked about earlier how up to 20% of the population has experienced out-of-body travels, including myself. The out-of-body phenomenon is one of the most reported strange listener stories we have. So many astral projection stories, so many out-of-body experiences at different levels of experience and often tying in with paranormal phenomenon, poltergeist activity, hauntings. Right. Brianna, Rachel, they all sent stuff in. A bunch of people. So we'll do this eventually. You got that great book from Sue. Oh, Sue LaRose. Yeah. Astral Dynamics. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn how to astral travel, that's a, basically a guidebook on how to do it. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Don't get your hand snagged by a hook. Hook. Right. By a locale three hook. That sounds creepy. Like they're trying to lure you in. So, yeah. Hey, like, who he's knows? Coming, he's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone get around. Let's celebrate. And then it's like, whoosh. We want you here. Yeah. Who knows what the hook, because what he said in that locale three, later in discovery, he realized that they didn't know about him. So who are these things in between that black space? They yeah. were trying to communicate with him. Oh, so I was in an in-between realm between, between the, the whole locale three. Yeah. Locale. It's, it. it's complex. It's John's Pennywise. It's, it's always <laughs> it in there. Uh, hanging out well, with his It's hooks. good at throwing its voice. It, it is. is. It is. All right, let's get to our last intrepid explorer, Kurt Leland, who wrote this really excellent book, which I barely scratched the surface of. We will have to do a deeper dive into his work, Otherwhere. Season 50. In season 50, so <laughs> stick around. But I did want to talk about briefly about some aspects like Guardians, other things you might experience there, other people. And his is very similar to Monroe's. His background is basically very quickly, and we'll do a deeper dive, but Basically, he was someone who had had out-of-body experiences unintentionally at the age of 14, astral traveled a lot. But once he, through his own exploration, discovered the Monroe Institute, which is the institute that Robert Monroe later started, this guy, Kurt, went there in the 80s, started astral traveling regularly there. And that's through these adventures and these experiences, he wrote this book, Otherwhere, which is constantly updated. It's a pretty fascinating book. Really, really interesting. He talks about different zones, human zones, non-human zones. But real quickly, I just want to touch on this borderland idea, these gatekeepers, Rangers and sleepers, and this is in the human zone. So this comes from his book, Otherwhere, which will be in the show notes. As indicated, non-physical reality consists of a number of regions or zones. For example, when we dream, we visit the dream zone. As in the rest of non-physical reality, thought instantly creates experience, there hence the instability of dream environments. Except in lucid dreams, where we become conscious that we're dreaming and can affect the dream reality at will. We're mostly unaware of the relationship between our thoughts and what we experience in our dreams. And when we die, we enter the after-death zone. Between zones are non-physical boundaries that keep them distinct. I often represent such boundaries as walls. Passages between zone gateways may be guarded by entities whose function is to determine who may or may not enter. So when he says he represents them, he's talking about when he's mapping these non-physical realities, his mind based on his earthly experience, interprets to the best of his mind's ability what these things are, like the boundaries of a wall or a desert, that kind of thing. The act of imposing conditions on those who wish to pass through a gateway seems to be the primary characteristic of gatekeepers, as the following encounter demonstrates. During an OBE, I found myself on a great barren plain. Abruptly rising in the middle of nowhere was a gate. The gate appeared to be made of ancient stone, an arch, just tall and wide enough for a single person to pass through. There was no wall on either side. It was the only distinguishable feature in that barren landscape. As I approached the gate, a grizzled old prospector who resembled a 19th century gold miner arrived ahead of me, carrying a bundle under his arm. The gatekeeper, an old man in robes, asked him a question. Apparently satisfied with the answer, the gatekeeper allowed him to pass through. Then, the gatekeeper addressed me. What is your mission in Otherwhere? I don't know what you mean. This is the barrier zone, also called the boundary zone. Otherwhere lies beyond the gate. Only individuals with missions in the Otherwhere may pass. Hoping not to seem obtuse, I asked about the barrier zone. The gatekeeper explained that it's the border between the dream zone and the rest of non-physical reality. 
You humans are notorious for your distractibility. Since thought manifests itself instantly as experience out here, we can't have minds wandering all over the place. In other words, randomness of thought creates pollution very unpleasant for the inhabitants to wade through. So we've confined most of you to the dream zone, where you'll have plenty of opportunity to experience the results of that randomness of thought, and perhaps to learn how to free yourselves from it. So. Yeah, basically saying I'm the guy who's going to keep you from going into the after death zone because when you bring your random dream creation, uh, pollutes the after. Yeah, if you zone. bring it into the after death. Yeah, zone. it makes total sense because right. my dreams are f- random, right? And not useful. Like maybe the- I want your dream cow like trampling me. It's in the a dream after pollution. Zone. Yeah, so the people that are living in the after death zone are uh, frustrated by these. You know, basically tourists that are coming in there in their dream state into the after death zone yeah, and like making a muck of everything. You're having like this perfect reality and then these like weirdo thoughts just start <laughs> right. coming in. Yeah. You're like what is that green giraffe <laughs> gallivanting in our beautiful streets? It's like when you're in Austin hanging out at the green belt and then someone comes down with their stereo and just yeah. in a totally different existence. Exactly. Just like blasting and the worst like, music. Oh, pollution. Get out of my other wear. Let me rest in peace. So this kind of makes sense, though, because yeah. it does seem like what he's saying basically is that dreams are where you create your reality almost. Yeah, what he's, what he's saying is that when we enter the dream zone, our emotions instantly begin to shape the, the environment. Okay. So if there wasn't this boundary here, because the physics seem to work very similarly in the after death right. zone. Like what dreams may come. Exactly. Wherever your mental state is, it kind of creates. Yeah. So because the physics work in both of those places kind of the same way, then yeah, you, you would have this pollution, this dream pollution into the people who are intentionally trying to form, if they can intentionally do it, their own experience as opposed to having these random weird dreams like you were talking about right. with the gallivanting green giraffe. It's a good example. So continue on with Kurt's experience here. Kurt continues. I asked if the gatekeeper would let me pass through the gate. The fact that you're in the barrier zone means that you've made it farther than most. Unfortunately, you're still contaminated enough with uncentering emotions to cause a problem once you're on the other side. I argued, pleaded, cajoled, but the gatekeeper remained unbending. Frustrated, I pushed my way through the gate. Just on the other side, a force knocked me to my knees, blocking further progress. Wow, this guy's really kind of going for it. The gatekeeper shrugged his shoulders and said, You can pass through only when you have a mission in the otherware and can complete it without distraction. Do you think the gatekeeper's pissed that I'm talking like this? Probably. He, he's when not going to let you through. One day when you get to the gate, he's going to be like, like, I heard the voice that you used on me. I'm not impressed. I sound nothing like that. And then I heard you making fun of the making fun of the voice. And that made me even madder. <laughs> and I listened to all your episodes. I liked you until that point. <laughs> so when he says things like otherware and stuff, th- these are terms that he's created, yeah, essentially. Right. right. He's, so he's interpreting what the, happened. Yeah, the guardian is not calling it otherware. Is it more telepathic than the Guardian didn't yeah, actually use actual that, words? Yeah, it is something called think action or mind think. Everything there is sort of a telepathic situation. Mind think as opposed to tummy think. Oh right? yeah, that's not, I'm not using the right term. You know your stomach is your second brain. It's true. Jeremy. It is. It's your flacco density. So basically I'll summarize what his takeaway from this experience was. Remember that grizzled old prospector, John, that was walking in there ahead of him? <clears throat> yes. That got to go through, mm-hmm. that was allowed in. His takeaway is that this guy was not an actual grizzled old prospector. He thinks he was projecting this image of a prospector onto him because this, he thinks, is another astral traveler who's hoping to strike it rich, who had potentially a specific goal in other where... Not literally strike it rich. Right. To strike it rich in information. Make a discovery. To make a discovery that this this guy, this would look like a prospector, was another astral traveler, or what he would refer to as a ranger. These people who astral travel into otherware with specific goals in mind. And the reason he wasn't allowed in, Kurt, was because he didn't have any specific questions to ask. But this prospector, he thinks, did. And so... He didn't want just some random bambler running around exactly. causing problems. Random bambler Distracting things up. So that was his takeaway from that. But we're barely getting into otherware. You might have to read that book. It's, it's really fascinating, John. It's broken down into these different zones. For example, there's all different sorts of entities you meet, like rangers, sleepers, Jeremy, as you kind of questioned earlier, those are people who are dreaming, John, like maybe you in your dreams. But they don't know they're dreaming. They don't know they're dreaming, but yet they enter into some of these zones. Mm-hmm. And they're known as sleepers because they're kind of like days. You can and, see them, but they're almost zombie-like, right? Right. They're like in Horizons. <laughs> oh, in <laughs> VR? <laughs> yeah. <and> not <laughs> in <laughs> Oculus Quest. Yeah. Um, but John, I think you'll find this book fascinating. The, he goes into a field guide. There's human zones, non-human zones, shadow worlds. The other in interesting thing that this brings up too is the idea that if this is out of space and time, the idea of the old prospector, it could have been an old prospector. It also could be that you could visit yourself from another 
time in your life. If you astral project at two different points in your life, right. you could run into each other if you happen to cross just paths. slow down here. <laughs> let's just, let's keep it together. A, oh, the one thing I was going to say was one of the reasons why he didn't think the prospector was necessarily an actual prospector who maybe died and was passing through here because he said, and this I thought was interesting, the gatekeeper basically said, those who are in the after death realm rarely are allowed to leave for periods of time. But that rarely there indicates that, at least according to him, according to this gatekeeper, is that sometimes the dead are allowed to return back through these boundaries. Maybe to, Maybe to somehow communicate. connect with a loved one or yeah. something. But it's very difficult. That's why you don't, people are always like, well, I've, I've never had an experience from my Well, you don't often get to talk to a loved one who's passed away. But yeah. if it does happen occasionally, maybe because you can operate on the same plane in a dream state, maybe one who's passed can come back. And that's where you could, I mean, you have those dreams of best right. you've lost yeah. that feel so real. Maybe it is. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, we didn't say this at the beginning or anything, but you know, hopefully going through this stuff, if you feel like we've stepped on your particular spiritual beliefs about how life after death works and everything, that's not our intention, obviously. Right. We're just, it's just an exploration. I don't think it necessarily has to conflict with, I think a lot of it can be how you interpret it. Right. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to negate a belief system about. Mm -hmm. And again, these are just two people who allegedly have these experiences and these adventures. So you have to read the books for yourself and make your own, you know, I'm not sure where I land on either of the work. I know that I'm watching interviews with Robert Monroe specifically. He seems like a very genuine guy. Kurt Leland reminds me of Preston Dennett. For some reason, just oh, really? his energy. But yeah, nice guy. check him out. Uh, see what you think. Yeah, obviously we're not making any decrees of how the non-physical realities are working. Just an interesting exploration, I think. Yeah, I agree. We hope you thought it was interesting. Well, we got to wrap it up. We are over time. All right. Guys, thank you for being here. Sorry about that, Trevor. We, it would have been good to read his story. We appreciate your emails too. Hi to London. Yes. And your email is ridiculous, sir. Oh, yeah. what's his email? Yeah. And what's his email? his phone number too. No, it'll be a mystery. Yeah, a lot of people submitted really awesome astral traveling stories. We'll have to get to you sometime. Mm -hmm. We'll do thank yous next time. But just briefly, we're going to mention this. We'll probably mention it again. We are going to be raising the tier level price for new members by 50 cents because of like... The additional fees that Yeah, we're getting a lot of fees for stuff. So the people that are signed up, your price isn't going to change. You're safe. Yes! So we're going to give a little time. If you want to sign up, it's a good time to do it. You'll beat the price hike. So it's going to go from $5 to $5.50, basically. Yeah. Right. That's It's just to help us out on some of the taxes that are being collected and the fees. Yeah, yeah only 50 cents more, but yeah, if you want to avoid that 50 cents more a month, then definitely sign up sign now. Sign up now. And we've got a few more tiers that are in the works, a few more options. We're going to add some a la carte items like the Stingers are coming back for people that want those. Awesome. And ice cream buffet. Hopefully we'll just continue to add more stuff so you guys can be more a part of the whole absolutely yeah. so get in here keep your eyes open for that and we'll make a formal announcement once it's up but it might be up before we do another episode so just keep your ears and eyes peeled absolutely all right guys i think that was a fun one hope you enjoyed it yeah yeah and we will see you expansion members in the expansion yeah get your butts over there you're missing out if you're not there with us and we'll see you next time on, on the belief hole. hole right john maybe <laughs> all right <laughs> see you guys You're basically a guardian, John. You're some astral overseer guardian dude. <clears throat> then the gatekeeper addressed me. What is your mission in other way? <laughs> See? <laughs> Sounds like a... Wait. Who's the Drug guy who Jimmy runs Stewart. the Senate right now? What is your mission in other way? <laughs> <laughs> you did sound just like Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Mitch Co McConnell? Cocaine Mitch. Oh, wow. Little Jimmy Stewart mixed mm -hmm. with Mitch McConnell. You should be a... Yeah, you're a guardian guy. I know, I'm joking. Okay. Oh, okay. That was a joke <laughs> voice. <laughs> thought you wanted to what is your mission in other way? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, ready? Yeah. What is your mission in other way? Is that good? Yeah, good. a little slower. Well, that's okay. sex sexy, though. You're in, like an, almost an omnipotent. Okay. What is your mission in other way? That's too low. What is your mission in other way? Can't that last part sucks. <laughs> what is your mission in other way? 
I don't like the ending. <laughs> it's too low for you. Other way. You can always pitch it down lower. Shut up. Since thought manifests itself instantly as experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>